Well, hello there. Good evening. It's Steve Watts here with another Spitfire session tonight. A real treat for you as we take you back to Kent's golden era. No question about that. A trophy laden decade, the 1970s. And for you this evening, we have four panelists who are synonymous with that time. We also have a very sort of presidential feel to tonight's panel as well. I shall explain more about that in just a moment. We haven't got Donald Trump on or anything, although probably quite a laugh, wouldn't it? Not intentionally so. Um, good news, breaking news this afternoon, uh, by the way, that uh, the ECB has announced that on the 1st of August, county cricket is set to resume. So that is the good news. That is hot off the presses, although if you're watching this in four days' time on YouTube, that's a very cold story. Keep across all of Kent's uh, social media channels, across the website, we'll give you more details as they emerge of what to expect from a very truncated two-month county cricket season starting on the 1st of August. Not exactly sure yet what sort of formats are going to be played. Well, it'll be t T20 is guaranteed, isn't it? But we're not sure what else is going to happen. Uh, so keep your eyes on Kent's social media and on the website for further details. But that is the good news. Just over a month away from the start at last of the county cricket season in 2020. Now, I continue thanks to Spitfire Shepherd Neem. This is the 11th uh, Spitfire session now. And uh, Spitfire Shepherd Neem have looked after us through every single one of them. And don't forget that you can head to their website if you're missing a part of Spitfire up at Bear Island or Whitstable Bay. Uh, go to Shepherd Neem's online shop and you can pick up your favorite there. And mini kegs are in stock now and only a few days until the pubs reopen this coming weekend. But if you are missing your shepherd name, head over to their online shop and uh, stuff is available for you there. Now then, let's crack on on Facebook Live and Zoom with tonight's Spitfire session. Time to introduce you four very special panellists. If you have questions while we're talking here, you can get them to us via the comments section on Facebook <coughs> and the Q&A section on Zoom. Let's introduce tonight's first panellist who made 493 appearances for Kent between 1968 and 1982. First overseas player to captain the club. Capped by Kent in 1968, named as a Wisdom Creed of the Year, also in 1968. Over 18,000, in fact, nearly 19,000 runs, 179 wickets, 10 major trophies. Captain of Pakistan in the inaugural World Cup in 1975, led the team to the semi-finals in 1979. It's a great pleasure to say good evening to Asif Iqbal. How are you? Good evening. Very well, thanks. You are looking magnificent, can I say? I was digging out some old pictures there. You look exactly the same as those pictures from 1978. You look terrific, the secret. Well, I really don't know, to be honest. Uh, I, I don't know. God has been kind. I think that's the only answer I can give. <laughs> He's been extremely kind. We can't even say that. Uh, next, let's introduce to you a man who is not only synonymous with the era, but is still seen to this day at the Spitfire ground. John Shepherd, all-rounder for Kent for 15 seasons between 67 and 1981. Then moving on to Gloucestershire, 303 appearances for Kent, 9,500 runs, over 800 wickets. Wisdom Cricket of the Year. Uh, John was uh, named that in 1979, former West Indies international. Uh, played the first, of, uh, first three of his five tests against England in 1969. Has gone on to serve as Kent president. That was back in 2011, really. And serve on the committee of the club. Good evening to John Shepherd. Hello, John. Hi, thanks, Steve. How are you? Yeah, we're good here, thank you. Um, I've never heard anyone ever have a bad word about you. And if you want that to stay <laughs> that way this evening, do not show anyone the badge on your that, shirt. That's, that's, why, that's why I'm... <laughs> that's why that's why I'm poor. You know, I I paid in to say a nice thing. I'm gonna struck I'm gonna move on quickly before I say something I regret about that shirt. Uh, <laughs> let's introduce our next panelist, uh, a versatile batsman, off spin bowler, key player throughout to this glory period we're looking at tonight, the nineteen seventies, captain nineteen seventy uh, itself, a career of more than 20 years, ending up in 1985. 376 first-class appearances, uh, nearly 13,000 first-class runs, 11 centuries, 1350s, 560 wickets, five wickets on 23 occasions. Uh, synonymous, again, with this glory one-day spell of this era. 
302 matches, five and a half thousand runs, over a hundred wickets. And this particular person has also been a Kemp president. That was in 2014, has served as chairman of cricket and has sat on the committee. Good evening to Graham Johnson. Delighted to have you with us. Evening, Steve, and uh, evening to everybody else. It's great to be back with the lads again. And, and let's introduce our fourth panellist. It's time to introduce another president of the club, Charles Rowe who played for Kemp for uh, eight years and then a three-year spell at Glamorgan. Uh, nearly 300 appearances for Kemp across all formats between 74 and 81, captain 77. Um, occasional bowl, 128 wickets with off-spin and uh, Charles Rowe, heavily involved with the club also. Uh, president, 2017, and also a server of the committee. Good evening to Charles Rowe. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. Nice to be on. Now, one thing that's, um, that's really struck me reading out your biography is that the length of your careers, the length of your association uh, with Kent, particularly with regard to those of you from overseas, um, something that we just don't see anymore. As if so long, what, 14, 15 years almost with Kent? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think that was my golden era of uh, cricket itself, not just uh, county cricket, but cricket itself, yes. A job we just we just don't see, do we, these days? Overseas players in particular spending more or less the whole career with one county. Well, I think that, re sorry, if you're asking me, uh, that the reason for that is I think uh, too many cricketers, cricket is no longer just a uh, sort of profession in which you are sort of uh, joining a county for loyalty or joining a county because you have got affiliation with it. It's more, it is more because of, I think, the rewards, the financial rewards. If you are doing well for one country, the other country tries to sort of uh, uh, offer you more money and you feel that, you know, that's a better option. So I think that that is one of the reasons, I think. And availability, another thing, of course, isn't it, with the calendar, uh, the way it looks these days. Thank you for sending in your questions in advance. The first one we're going to crack on with is Kevin's question here. Uh, which says, what was it about the team during this 1970s golden era that enabled us to win so many trophies across different formats? I think I'll start with Graham Johnson on this one. So successful in all the formats, Graham. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of build-up that uh, got us to where we were. I mean, the fact that the, the side had so much talent in it, uh, and it wasn't just 11 players, it was, it was a squad of players. Um, if you think back, uh, we, we, we won something in 67 for the first time, I think, in 50 years. So there was a, a huge amount. I remember Kipper saying to me as a young player, as I first got into the side, look, we're building something here. And it wasn't just about the cricket. It was about building something with all the members, with all the supporters. And he actually asked us to do a lot of things that weren't necessarily on the cricket field. Um, and I think the reason we were successful, number one, it was a talented squad. Good blend of guys who played at the top, led by someone who was an all-time great. Um, some magnificent overseas players, two of whom are here. And they, you know, they undersell what they did for the county. But um, it was, it, it was uh, I don't know, it was a family affair almost with the players, the, uh, the, the people watching and the whole thing. It'd be, it, we got on a roll. Uh, and we were able to maintain it for a while. So it was great to be part of. And Charles, in those days, was there so much of a, of a difference between the formats? I'm thinking of Sunday League was 40 overs. Um, you had the Gillette Cup was at 60 overs. Was it still 65 at the start of the 70s? Was it 65 no, overs? When I played, it was 60. 60. Yeah. yeah. But you had yeah. 55 overs in the, the B&H Cup, and of course you played it. You played in white, you have red ball. Was there so much of a difference then between limited overs and championship cricket as there is now? I, I, well, I, th I think for me anyway, I, I always felt that the, the championship cricket was the, the, the real cricket that mattered. And the one day cricket was sort of a bit like the icing on the cake. But the way our side was... Um, geared up we had so many match winners and so many all-rounders um that you know we had a number of guys that could come in score 50 get five wickets whatever and so you know we were we were incredibly lucky in that respect um one of the things that that obviously 
be a bit different now, I think, is, is looking at the, the 40 over scores that uh, were, were a sort of the norm in those days, which is, I don't know, probably about 180. And you're now looking at the T20 and uh, they're, they're getting about the same total. So, uh, um, yeah, probably we hadn't quite learned to um, uh, play the 40 over game as, as well as they do the 20 over game these days. And John Shepherd back in the in the 1970s, what, did you have pretty much the same team going from championship cricket to limited overs? Were there many changes between the two squads? Not, not, not really. I, I think um, the the eleven guys who played on the Saturday, or you know, the first, which would have been the first day of the game, I think they are more or less um, played on the on the Sunday in the Sunday league match. You know, but remember that the Sunday League didn't come until 69, I think. Mm. So, um, yeah, but the, as, as John Ross said earlier, I mean, we were, we had such a good squad, you know. Um, I mean, people like, we had so many all-rounders, you know, you had um, Bob Bulmer, as if, you know, as if could bowl when he wanted to. I don't know <laughs> if he's still listening. <laughs> but I tell you what, he, he, that guy could bowl some quick deliveries. Um, but we had um, Bob Wilmer, you know, Bernard Julian. So we, we had a very, very, very good squad. And so, I mean, it, it, I don't think that our success was really anything that somebody, nobody would have expected. You know, we just had a very, very good team. And we were blessed, quite honestly, because everybody more or less stayed fit. Yeah. The Asif, it's the captain's prerogative, Asif, surely, to bring yourself on to bowl whenever you want. But how was it captaining a team with so many all rounders? Did you find, particularly when you're making bowling changes, you had so many options at your disposal? Yeah. Before I answer that, I just want to mention one thing. The question is, you know, about the team in the 70s and the reason for our success. I think the main reason was we used to enjoy the game. It was fun for us. And we all played together. It was a team sport in which we had fun and enjoyment and we were playing for each other. We wanted, we were rooting for each other. We wanted every player to do well. If, I'm not, if, I'm, if I haven't done anything on that day, I'm rooting for the other player. And every player did that. So I think th those two were the main reasons that the fun and the enjoyment, along with what Jono said earlier on about uh, Colin, uh, who was the captain, who instilled in, in, in us, you know, it's not just playing on the field, but also the fun and enjoyment you're giving to the crowds, the, the, the supporters, they were coming to watch us. So I think that, that was the main, for, for me, that was the main reason because, you know, there were many other teams far more talented maybe uh, than Kent, but they couldn't win because I think they didn't have that kind of, uh, uh, what you call it, camaraderie or uh, that togetherness. So that, that's my answer for that particular question. But for your question, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you see, bowling was really fun for me. But I wasn't physically not that fit to continue bowling for longer spells because I had a severe back injury way back in 67 when I came to England. And that really sort of stopped me. But I still remember the fun Sheppy and others used to make of me, oh, his back is gone. So it's not going to bowl. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't the reason. Yes, uh, I loved, I loved uh, bowling as much as I loved batting. I loved uh, fielding. So just being part of the team, irrespective of what I'm doing, what was really the fun and joy of it. Actually, one of the Graham, things did you want to come back? Sorry, Graham. Forget, yeah, I mean, one of the things people forget is, as Shep said, we used to start a three-day game as it was then in, on a Saturday, Sunday play a 40 over the game, then go back and finish off the, the three-day game. Um, and we did have one or two people who, who did play one-day cricket, because I remember Richard Hills, who, who doesn't get up and mentioned very often, but he was... He was fundamental to our uh, 40 over side. His nickname was the vicar because he only worked on Sundays. So uh, there were people who, um, you know, came in and out the side. Now, what you, you mentioned there, the three-day game started on a Saturday, then you play a, a 40 over match on a Sunday, you come back on a Monday and resume the championship match. Graham, we hear a lot these days about the calendar and it's T20 year and then there's a championship match and players are confused. Did that get mentioned back in those days? Uh, well, to, to be fair, they messed around with the rules so much in those days. As you mentioned, Gillette Cup was 65 overs, 60 overs. 
John Player was 40 overs, Bolds could have unlimited run-ups, then they had um, the short run-up, it was covered pitches, uncovered pitches. I think it was an era where you, um, if you got the right attitude that Asif was talking about in the side, it was, well, you know, we're good enough, we think we can do it, whatever we're going to play, we're going to get on and do it. Um, I think, to be fair, as players, uh, over a season, there were work times where you a lot of wear and tear because the amount of cricket that's being played. So I've got a lot of the sympathy with the current players about their approach. And in, we, we probably would have played better quality 40 over cricket, as, as Charles was mentioning, if it was all in a block. But if it's in the middle of a, a three-day game, a changing from one to the other, we did it, but it, it, it could have been easier. Mm. And Just one other thing, Steve, sorry, uh, to bear in mind was that we, we did a lot of travelling as well in those days because I remember I think my second season we, we finished the match on a, a Friday down at Folkestone. We then had to travel up to York I think that evening and I, I was with a chap David Laycock who had a, a Volkswagen Beetle and uh, Richard Elms I think and we got there about two in the evening, two at night and, and um, we then had to play the next day at Harrogate and then from Harrogate, after the Saturday game, we then had to go to Scarborough for the Sunday League, then back to York to play at Harrogate for the Monday, Tuesday, and then down to Dover after that. <laughs> so, you know, you got a bit sort of motorway lagged, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and don't, forget, don't forget also, Charlie, and I think when I started, I think we played something like um, 28 three-day games. Together, it was a hell of. I mean, it wasn't a division one and division two then. You know, we played against everybody. You know, home and away. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm exhausted listening to those contributions, um, but it does lead me very nicely into Chris's question here. Uh, Chris saying, "Change isn't always a good thing." That's the truth. Uh, if the panel could reintroduce something from the 1970s that we don't see today, what would it be? and why? Maybe we'll start with Asif on this one. Um, one thing I might like to throw in there, Asif, is the, the balance between bat and ball in limited overs yeah. cricket, particularly these yeah, days. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think a uh, lot can be uh, actually can be taken from the 70s. Uh, as you mentioned about the balance between bat and ball, look at the amount of changes that have come since then, uh, not only in the rules and regulations, but also the gear that they wear now, they've got the helmets, they've got the chest pads, they've got the elbow pads, blah, blah, blah. Then the fielders have got the helmets, they've got shin pads, all those things. What, what has happened because of that? I, I'm not against it because obviously security comes first. But the, the, the reason I'm slightly not too comfortable with all those things is that element of enjoyment, you know, like Michael Holding coming on to bowl or Dennis Lilly or John Snow coming on to bowl and you are without any helmet, without chest pad and without elbow pad. And seldom, seldom, I think it happened that we got it. I did get hit. I had a fractured cheekbone once, but we, we took it in the, on the, you know, just in the stride. And we felt that uh, part of the game. But so many changes have come now, not only in the, uh, the, the gear that you're wearing, but also uh, rules and uh, regulations. Number of uh, bounces have been restricted number of overs have been restricted in certain competitions. All those changes, no, there's no doubt whatsoever. The players are playing, uh, in, in a way, especially international cricket, far too much than we used to play uh, during our era. Uh, but, but again, the, they're being rewarded. I mean, the financial rewards that they are getting now, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't even imagine what, uh, uh, in, in those days, what these guys are getting. But having said that, I think now cricket has evolved. We have to accept it. It's no longer a uh, sort of uh, uh, spectacle for just the spectators on the ground. It's the television which is literally uh, ruling the, the cricketing world because there's so much advertising is involved in it, so much finances has been put into it. And the, the only thing that I really feel missing watching these youngsters, these kids playing this uh, yeah, all, all formats, that there seems to be so much emphasis on uh, doing well and winning. 
and, and, and that has taken away the smile on the faces when you were, you know, when we were used to play, we used to interact with the crowd. We used to sort of have literally fun uh, while playing with each other too, uh, on the field, with the opposition as well. Somehow that's missing. So I think that, that, that element, if you can, I don't know how it can happen, but if that element can be introduced, uh, it will make a huge difference. But then uh, having said that, I also accept there is going to be criticism that I know I'm talking about uh, an era which is 50 years uh, gone, uh, gone by, by gone rather. So yeah, it has evolved and we just have to accept it. But I would like to see more players getting uh, sort of interaction of players, not only with each other, with the opposition on the field, but also with the crowd. Graham, is it um, an inevitable consequence of a more, shall we say, rewarding era financially? You might want to throw the word professional in there. Uh, that perhaps it isn't going to be so much fun, therefore. There isn't going to be so much interaction with crowd. There isn't going to be so much emphasis on enjoyment. It's going to be more about winning. Yeah, uh, I mean, things move on. Uh, I think we, we all accept that. I don't think you can take fun out. Because I, I, it's only, I don't know if you watch Liverpool play, the way they play, they play some amazing football, but just yeah. watch the way they interact as a club. Um, I think if you've got the, the right guys with the right attitude to the game, you do have to think about the people that are, are watching, whether they're on the ground uh, or, or through the television. And it, um, th there's a lot of other things they could be doing and watching. And I think, uh, you, you can't take the fun out of it and you've got to remember it is, it's a product for people to watch or, or they can choose not to. But I mean, the, the, my answer to you, the, the question you're asking is that the one thing I'd change is over rates. Um, oh, yeah. I, I think in, in a way that the public feel a bit cheated. I, it, the game has got more professional, but it's got, um, uh, it gets, it's got very samey, not, not the, the 20 over stuff, because obviously people are watching that. But watching um, four-day cricket now, the, the, the amount of variety and the, the struggle to get the allotted number of overs in a day um, is something that needs to be looked at because in, in a way, you, you, if you started early, you could go back to three-day cricket and play the same number of overs if you got through more overs in a day, uh, <laughs> even on covered wickets. But um, I, I haven't got facts and figures about how many overs we used to bowl, but uh, it just feels there's been a constant reduction in the number of overs down to somewhere where it, it needs reversing a little bit. I think we all say amen to that. Um, absolutely overrates. Shocking job. Back in the day, how many overs would you have bowled in a day's championship? Too many. Or in any school, how many overs would you expect to get through? <laughs> <laughs> Too many. I mean, I, I used to hear people say that um, um, Colin used to put me on, I used to work in the <clears throat> pavilion in at Canterbury. And I think that they forgot that I was bowling because, I mean, I think I, I remember one day at Southampton, I opened the bowling and I think I bowled right through to lunch. So, Marco, I got a, I got a couple of wickets, but, <laughs> you know. But the thing, you know, one of the things that I, you know, going back to what Asif was saying just now, and John, you know, one of the things that I, I, I mean, this is nothing to do with the cricket itself, but, you know, I, I think in our day, you know, um, the sort of um, camaraderie between the teams was so much better. You know, I mean, we, I mean, we try to knock each, on, each other's heads off on the field, but at the end of the day, we, you know, we went in the marquee, you know, especially cricket week, something like that, and the two teams were together. Um, and I would, I would like to see a bit more, you know, sort of um, communication between, you know, between the teams. You know, we're not enemies. You know. And everybody, you know, everybody was, and I, I, I can tell you now that in the old days, you know, the umpires helped us out on the field, you know, the old umpires, you could talk to them, you know, they would tell you, look, you're getting a bit close to the, to the, you know, to the stumps, you know, you get, you're getting close to no balls and that type of thing. And I think something like that is missing from, from our cricket now, you know. From Charles, someone who's still heavily involved now. Anything from your playing days you'd like to see maybe come back into the current era? Uh, I think, well, as 
the guys have said, I mean, the, the, the socialising after the game was obviously a key aspect, I think, of play in those days. But for me, the, the core cricket when we played was the, the first class game, the three day game. Um, I'm not saying that they should play three day get cricket now, but I, I do feel that the four day game is, is sort of not really emphasised. You played at the beginning of the season and you played at the end of the season. I would like to see more four day cricket um, being played to give the guys a, a better chance of doing well in test matches. Because for me, I still see that as the ultimate. If you're playing for a county side, you want to play in the test side ahead of playing in the one day side, if you can. And to do that, you have to do well in, in the four day format. So you need to play more rather than just at the end of each and beginning and end of each season when the wickets tend to be pretty green and uh, you know you, you, you could be struggling a bit. We were lucky, we played throughout the season. <clears throat> Talking of socialising after the game, um, I managed to dig out this afternoon a book, I'm not sure if you can see that here, Kent's The Winning Eleven, uh, which I was given donkeys years ago, and it, all four of you were featured heavily, and in fact, as if it's like your personal photograph album, that you're in it loads. <laughs> and you look exactly the same. Um, but here, talking about socialising, there's a great picture in there. I'll start with you, Graham, on this one, of players having lunch. And there are pints sitting on the table. And it's lunchtime, <laughs> I presume, in the championship match. Now then, that's something from a previous era we're not going to see anymore. Well, no, this is very scientific. Because this was, um, if you talk to athletes, you know, especially marathon athletes, and they're very uh, careful about their carbohydrate loading, the easiest way to get carbohydrates into your body is through uh, a beer. <laughs> Not many is that right? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, it has changed. I mean, um, you, you, if you go back far enough, you'll see people sitting there having a cigarette, which, you know, nowadays is what, what's complete anathema. I mean, things, yeah. things move on. Um, uh, yeah, it's quite funny sitting with the guys when we have the players' reunion where... I remember the one about two two years ago when I was down there, and I think it was Alan Brown. Um, somebody got a wicket with, the, I think, the third ball of the the first over of play, uh, which was great because it was one of our guys, but the, on they came with drinks. And I think AB said, well, is that just water they're bringing on there or is it something else? Uh, but he was, I think he was making the point that, you know, do you really need a drink after three balls? Um, it, that's one aspect. Yes, we socialise quite a lot, not, not, not just with the opposition, but with um, people in the, who sponsored the game and came down, the members, um, and off the field. We did quite a lot off-season, speaking at cricket club dinners and all sorts of things. So it was all part of the scene. The scene's changed, uh, most of it for the good. So, um, But I don't think you can knock what the norm was in those days, because the norm was the norm, um, and it's a different norm now. Yeah, I don't know when this, this book would have been published, I presume sort of the late 70s, but um, can't, you can tell a lot, can't you, by the adverts. I love it. There's an advert here for a Leyland car. Anyone want a Leyland car? Uh, there's an advert there for a packet of fags. I mean, you wouldn't see that now. I can't show you that. But what I can show you is, um, we can see yeah, this. You to Look get at that. To... Look. Oh. Look at that. <laughs> There's the vicar. The vicar's there, look. <laughs> he is, Derek Underwood. And there's a teen photo underneath. There it is. Yeah. And, and do you see what I mean? Look, Asif looks younger now. Absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> That's incredible. Asif, do you remember what you used to, what you used to have for lunch in those days? Lunch and tea? <laughs> oh, it's just that is dinner by the looks of it. Oh. Uh, well, whatever the boys used to have, there's nothing special for me. But uh, no, I, th I think uh, there wasn't that much emphasis on what we are eating and how much we are eating and all that. It was up to the individual. Uh, sort of what you're doing but nowadays i mean again we are, you know not comparing to what we were and what the present day is but i laugh when i hear a touring team uh, coming with 14 players playing uh, squad and they've got about 20 backroom staff in which they also have got a dietitian and he's the one who's telling you what you're going to eat for lunch breakfast dinner and all that so times have changed but uh, yeah, I mean, we just ate what was given to us. There was there wasn't any restrictions. There were there weren't any special uh, request or demand. So mm -hmm. I think things have changed. Steve, sorry, the the one person who did actually 
uh, look after himself in our time was Notty. Um, yeah, absolutely. He, he had food combining. He, he, he knew some guru that, that said you had to have meat with vegetables or vegetables with carbs or whatever it was. And uh, I remember talking to him about it and he's, he said, you know, this, this is the way forward. And I said, well, do you think that's really the case? And he says, well, speak to me in 40 years time. So I, I saw him on being interviewed by Cow the other day, I think, um, on a recording. And uh, he did look pretty well, I have to say. But, uh, but he was the only one that was really very careful. <laughs> and on that theme, Charles, you're a magician. Uh, we have a special with Alan Knott, which is going to happen on Wednesday evening, I believe. So keep your eyes posted on Kent's social media channels, which means Twitter and some other things that I don't know how to work. Uh, but if you do, then tune in because Alan Knott, very special uh, interview with Alan Knott on Wednesday evening. He gets his own program, lads. We all have to share. Well, well worth watching. Is he? Is he? Is he? Is he in the? Is he in the country now? Then. That's what I, I am led to believe. All right. Okay. He is a and very special person. Yes. That'll be well a, worth watching. Steve. I think on, 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 there used, used to be ten Graham Johnsons for an Aussie big ball. Just the swap <laughs> and the <no, I> don't. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just round off the talk of nutrition, diets, lunch, tea, and all those sorts of things with you, John? You bowled all morning long. You bowled all day long. It's sweltering hot. You've had a day in the field. How would you spend the evening? I take it not by jumping into an ice bath. <laughs> no, jo <laughs> I think John, John, was, John would have taken me to an Indian restaurant. <laughs> oh, how lovely. <laughs> how lovely. Now that is, that is proper. That's how to do it. Um, thank you, chaps, for your answers on those questions. We've had a live one sent in. It's specifically for Graham Johnson um, from Tim. And don't forget, you can get involved uh, on Facebook Live and Zoom with your questions while we chat on this webinar. Ghastly word, but that's the word we use. Um, can Graham give us his memories of the 1976 Benson <coughs> Hedges Cup final? Um, last week, we had Matthew Fleming on here, Graham, and uh, in very posh tones, he was telling us about some of the footage you can watch on YouTube. There's some of those great finals are all on there to watch on YouTube. You're there with your collars flapping, about three buttons undone. Can you give us your memories of the 76 B&H final? Um, was that the Worcester one? Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. You were man of the uh, match, though, that one. Oh, right, yeah. I've done, I've, I've, as you can gather, I'm not that great remembering matches and things. But, I mean, obviously that was a great one for um, the team. And, yeah, I, I had a good day, which, which was great. Um, but, again, it, 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 it kind of gets subsumed into the build-up with the guys going into the match. Um, I think if I remember rightly, in the week before, we just lost a, it might have been a semi-final to Sussex at Canterbury, where we didn't play very well. And um, you know, going into a final, it wasn't exactly the best build-up. And we did spend quite a lot of time together saying, well, we didn't get that quite right. How we, what are we going to do about it? Uh, and, and when you've got a bunch of people like we had in the team then, you know, working out something that eventually comes right on the day. Um, that, for me, is what it's all about. I mean, it was a great feeling that having not played very well uh, and, and lost midweek in front of another massive crowd at Canterbury, um, we, we, we were up against it a little bit and uh, we produced the goods on the day um, at Lord's. Uh, we'd still like to have won the one before as well. But um, for me... Yes, it, I was lucky, I had a good day, but for me it was all the build-up of the few days, going to Lords, the atmosphere, and pulling it off for all the, all the Kent fans there. Have you ever was seen that the, Was that the okay, match sorry. where... Sorry, John, go on. Sorry, was that the match where Dolivera was injured? Yeah, yes. He came, right. came in and got 50 on one leg. Yeah. Right. One of the best I, shots have, I have a been. strong memory of that match. Um, John O's, you know, got... 70 odd I think and Bobby Woolmer got 60 and um, I came into bat I think I was batting number eight so I'm not quite sure I was in the side but anyway I came into bat at number eight with six balls to go and Imran was playing for Worcester at the time before he went to Sussex and he was only bowling sort of little medium fast stuff in those days I faced two ball the last two balls of the second last over which I sort of blocked and then Norman Gifford bowled the last over and in those days there were no fielding restrictions 
So everyone was on the boundary. Asif was batting brilliantly. <laughs> and he came up to me and he said, right, everyone's on the boundary. We're going to take two every ball. And I was reasonably quick, but Asif was like greased lightning between the wickets. I've never seen anyone so quick. And so they were always going to throw my end. And um, about third or fourth ball, I should have been run out, but Imran apparently knocked the stumps over with his elbow before running me out, so that was all right. But eventually I got run out for naught off the last ball. And <laughs> as I came in, someone in the crowd, I think a Kent supporter, did, said to me, well batted. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, yes, I'm not quite but sure. The thing what was, Charlie, you, con you contributed to the, to the score. Yeah, possibly if I hadn't had pads. That's big partnership with Asif. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, aren't we confusing this match? Because I, I think the match we are talking about, in which Dolly got injured, they got runs, and but I think that's the match in which I was the man of the match. I got runs and I got four wickets, I think. And the memory no, that I have of that... One, it was another one. I, I didn't know, because I, I remember Dolly Vera getting that injury and scoring those runs. I got four wickets, I think, in that match. And I also got runs. But I, the thing I remember is I dropped the catch. And when I got the man of the match, I may, I may, you may be right. My memory may be, you know. Uh, no, I, not, I looked it up, Asif. Right. So I, I remember dropping a catch, but I got the man of the match. And I think, uh, I don't remember who the uh, presenter was who was giving the. And he said that the only, uh, the only thing which he needs to improve is his fielding. <laughs> Because I had dropped the catch, but I still got the man of the match, and we you won might that uh, have the match, match against Derby. As Asif, Asif, no, no, yeah, I, I yeah. think Asif, I think, yeah. it, I think the, the catch you dropped was off me. Yeah, probably, <laughs> probably, but no, it wasn't against Derby. I, I, I'm absolutely sure it was against Wooster. And what you mentioned about Imran bowling, yes, I remember that Imran bowling, and you know we are getting those uh, runs, quick runs. But I'm absolutely certain, unless I've gone bonkers. No, you've gone bonkers. Against Worcester. Uh, I would like, I, I would like, uh, out of the match. I, would, I would like Steve to check that. Don't, don't but, worry about, yeah. don't worry about it, Asif. I can't remember, catches. I can't remember matches either. Jono got four <laughs> catches and 70 odd. You got 49. Yeah. You got one wicket in that one. No, I'm not talking about that match. I'm talking about the match in which Dolly got <laughs> runs and also, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and also he looked Imran young, Steve, in. but you know, I mean, <laughs> Steve, Steve, get a grip. <laughs> well, I would if I could get a word in edgeways. They do keep saying, don't they, that the lockdowns lead to extra tensions bubbling under, but I didn't think it would come up on this. Um, has, has anyone seen, this is the point I wanted to ask, you in particular, Graham, has anyone seen these old YouTube uh, footage of, of these finals back in the day? I absolutely can't see the ball. But they're absolutely terrific. There's one I remember, Graham, you're just walking off to the pavilion at Lords, I think, accompanied by the tones of Jim Laker, pure heaven. <laughs> I've, I've certainly not seen them. I think the only time I saw some was when um, I think Brian Lacker had a benefit and he, he knew someone at um, BBC and they, they did a, an edited highlights of his career. But it was all black and white stuff. So in a way, it's kind of nice to know it's, it's there, just to go back and uh, have a look at it. See how bad in the day. Oh, no, it's magnificent. So, and I say Jim Laker. Oh, what a voice. Um, next question is specifically for Asif. It's been sent in by Asif Kazi, who says, I'm a huge fan of yours, Asif Iqbal. With your talent, <laughs> you are you. suitable for any form or any format uh, of cricket. Would you love to have played T20 if it was around then? Would you love to have had a go at T20, Asif? Right. I've got a good answer for that. When I started, not my, I'm not talking about first class career or you know, even college career. I'm talking about when I started playing cricket in school, all I wanted was to play, be it, be it as, a, as a 12 man who's on the field fielding or, or bowler, just being in the team as a bowler or a batsman, even if I'm batting at number 10. So for me, that was more important, just to be part of, uh, of the team, to be on the ground. So uh, answering this question, Yes, certainly. But if, again, the, the, the big if comes, if it was li like when we were playing county cricket, then the John Play League was introduced, although Gillette was there before, but John Play was introduced then. And, and all, all the panel which is here and all the players in those era, we all loved it. We enjoyed it. And we really, really sort of 
had, had fun and, and we won trophies. So the answer to that is yes, I would have loved to. But again, I don't go, you know, as, as I was saying earlier, cricket has evolved <laughs> and things have changed. But if I were to be in the present, yes, I would have loved to. Graham, back in the day, was um, the 40 over stuff, the Sunday League, sponsored by a tobacco company. Um, was that your version of T20? I mean, do you remember when it was on BBC, wasn't it, back in the day, the, the Sunday League? Yeah. It used to have a massive audience and massive crowds, I'd take it. Yeah, yeah. In the, uh, going back to an earlier question, like we used to get 200 cigarettes each in the dressing room afterwards. <laughs> 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 Well, it, that, that was only made better. That was only bettered once, I think. We won the John Player in '72, and we had to go off to the West Indies uh, to play all the islands on a tour. And on that tour, uh, I think we were on 15 different islands. Uh, and on every island, when we arrived in the hotel room, there were 200 John Player cigarettes and a bottle of rum each. So by the end of the tour, <laughs> you know, talk about <laughs> um, it was it was. I mean, it was the format. I mean, I, I, um, I, I, I would have loved to play T20. I mean, I love watching it. Um, it's, uh, it's great for cricket. And I think anyone who's played cricket, especially if you look at the, the side we had back there, would we have been good at it? I don't know. But we would have certainly given it a good crack. And with the, the all-rounders in the side, um, uh, I think we'd have loved to have a go at it. Um, but 40 overs in those days was seen as um, the T20 now. And John Shepherd, just imagine if you played T20 cricket, none of this bowling all morning or bowling all day, four overs and you'd be done, John. I know, I know. And I probably would have been a millionaire as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you to me, I mean, like, I, again, I, I'm going to agree with something that Asif said there, you know. I, I think we, we were blessed in a way when we played because, you know, we Played, we played because we loved it. I mean, okay, we got re we were reasonably paid, you know. I mean, not the, the sort of money that the guys get now, you know. And I don't begrudge them one penny that they get. But I mean, it was such a lovely feeling. I mean, how many people can tell you they go to work, you know, and they enjoy what they're doing? And I think that, you know, to be a professional sportsman. You've got to love every minute of it. Otherwise, what's the point of playing? Sure. Absolutely. Charles, you fancy a bit of T20? Yeah, it's, I, I guess, you know, we, we like playing as much cricket as we could. And uh, obviously, T20 is a fantastic game to watch, I think. I, th I think the one thing that I, I think these days, compared with our day, which uh, is fantastically good, is... is the, the batting that you see, you know, the improvisation, the skill at hitting sixes, etc. And also, um, the outfielding is unbelievably good um, these days. And so I really enjoy watching it. Um, but obviously, yeah, I would have had to learn, um, as, I, as I didn't have the power of some of these guys, I would, I would have had to learn a few reverse sweeps and God knows what, really. But uh, um, these, these guys are just brilliant when you watch them. Hang on, Charlie. You're about the only person in the world that's taken a first-class wicket bowling left arm and right arm. So there's a bit of improvisation there. I could have tried, yeah, but I'm not sure I'd bowl left arm in, in the T20. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Steve. I think something that we've got to remember too. I mean, um, we're going back to the days pre-helmet days. Um, I mean, you see guys now playing. I know it is very love, it's great for television and whatnot. I mean, could you imagine playing a ramp shot against any bowler without a hel without a helmet on? No, I couldn't. <laughs> you know, so a lot of the improvisation now is because of all the you know armory that the guys the guys have. You know, but I I still maintain that if you were good enough to play. Again, in my day, the three-day game, you were good enough to play um, the um, Sunday League or the Gillette Cup and whatever, you know. So I know, I know nowadays you have all these different squads, you know. You've got a white ball squad, you've got a pink ball squad, you've got, you know. Um, but I think if you're good enough, 
I think you should be able to master any of the formats. I couldn't imagine playing any of these lap shots or anything, helmet or no helmet, to be honest. Was it you, Asif, who was saying 10, 15 minutes ago about facing Michael Holding, of course, with no helmet? I mean, that's a terrifying prospect. Well, uh, you know, I, I remember playing, uh, I think it was Jamaica, the last test that, uh, uh, the last test I played against the West Indies uh, or, or touring uh, with Pakistan team. And everybody after that uh, series, when I was questioned about the fast bowlers, and, that, that, and I think that was the year I was also appointed the captain of Kent. So I, not that I'm <laughs> boasting about it, but I did get a hundred. In the, in the last things that I played. And Jamaica was, Sheppy would know about it, was one of the fastest wicket in the world, or considered to be. And everybody was talking about uh, how I managed to face and who was the fastest bowler I faced. My answer was that Joel Garner, to me, in that particular match that I played, there was one delivery. I can honestly say that I, I, I didn't see when it uh, sort of, I don't know, how it missed me. It was the fastest delivery I still remember when I think about it, that I was sort of just coming into position and the ball had just whisked past my right shoulder. And playing those fast bowlers without all this, the, the present, uh, what you have, uh, the protection, we didn't think about it. That was the reason I think uh, we didn't think about it. So the reactions were good and sort of uh, occasionally we did get uh, injured. But uh, because of not having that protection, either we were ducking or we were sort of hooking or playing it, uh, playing it properly. But nowadays, with all the protection that they have, the fast bowlers and, and then the limitation of bounces that you, are, uh, that you can't bowl more than, I think all that has taken away that element of, uh, uh, I don't know what's the right word to say, but yeah, but I suppose the right thing to do what they're doing now. But something is missing. Would you say that, Asif, that you were a better player for having no, no or very little protection? No, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that I was a better player, but I would certainly say that there was excitement because of that. And there were, there were far greater cricketers during my era who were also playing without any helmets and performed exceptionally well against you know, the likes of Lilies and Thompsons and Holdings and Roberts. And I think uh, uh, when, when uh, I think it was... For Hampshire, if I'm not mistaken, Andy Roberts used to play. And the first year that he came, I think he was amazing. I think he got the most wickets and the, the, the least <laughs> number of runs given. And, and we were not uh, sort of used to facing that kind of bowling in county cricket. But, but, but we did. We faced. So uh, I don't know whether it's right to classify better play, but we, but we were sort of equipped to manage it better, I would say, mentally. And talking of that, uh, that great West Indies team, particularly the, the fast bowlers they, they had in the 70s and, of course, through into the 80s. So there was a question came in, John, for you. I don't have it in front of me here, but about how many tests you played and would you have liked to have played more? I'm assuming the answer to that is yes, but what a team that was, that West Indies team, to try and break into regularly. Well, I, I was pre, I was pre that, 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 um, team, that team. Don't forget that I played just after the war, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, first world war yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no um i yeah i, I mean I, I played five tests and i was very i was very unlucky i don't, to this day i don't know why why i didn't play more you know i go to Barbados, you know more more or less every year now and i play a lot of golf with um Sigari. And every now and again, we have, a, you know, when we're having a chat, you, you know, he says to me, oh, you know, you should have played more tests, you know, and I just, Mark, you, I might have had a beer or two by then. And I, I always say to him, well, you, don't tell me that. No, you were the captain, you know, you should know why I didn't play more, you know, but our cricket was very, very political. So, you know, it was a, a great honor to have played the five tests I played in. So at least, you know, the, there was a guy who played for Middlesex, Eric Russell. I think he played one one test match, I think, for England. You know, and he said, you can't take it away. So I played in five, so you can't take them away. So it was a, a great honour to play. 
Now, a question has come in here from Nigel. Uh, Nigel Medhurst, it's a question that comes up every single week when we go back to previous eras about uh, all the different grounds that Kent used to play at. And Nigel said he's got fond memories of watching Kent play at the Moat, at the Garrison Ground in Gillingham. Um, what was your favourite Kent ground to play on and why? Charles, did you have a particularly uh, favourite uh, outground? Yes, uh, prob probably. I mean, I, I would say probably Tunbridge Wells in that I think it was, you know, the, the prettiest of the Kent grounds. Um, whenever you had the, I think it was the Borgen Billier, um around the ground. Um, I had a, I had a good match there. I think I got my first hundred there. So obviously that, that helps. Um, the other one I really liked was Maidstone. Um, I thought, I thought that was a lovely ground and probably the best wicked in Kent in those days. Um, so yeah, Tunbridge Wells or Maidstone would be my two choices anyway. Jono, how many different grounds were, when you started playing, how many different outgrounds were there being used? Oh, good question. Uh, there were probably six or well, seven. Nine, I think. Yeah, Did Darts, there were nine, Rose, Dover, Maidstone, Tunbridge Wells. Uh, yeah. Dartford. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in those days, we're talking about a different era and the travel that people did is different. So in a way, in those days, I think you could take the cricket to the people. Nowadays, it's changed and um, people quite rightly expect decent facilities to watch their cricket. And uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that, that Kent have got a ground in the north end of Kent because of that, that that's where I come from. Um, um, Blackheath was uh, the ground that we played at there and we, we had some good results there, although it was a nightmare to play on because the outfield was uh, on the rugby square. So if you were fielding mid-off and someone smacked it straight at you, you the long barrier went out the, out the window because you didn't know whether it was going to go straight along the ground or over your head. But um, you know, having, <laughs> having, having grounds in the north of Kent is really important so that, that Kent cricket is truly the whole of Kent, not just an East Kent cricket club. And um, nowadays, um, you can't do it with so many grounds. You can't keep them to the standards or provide the f facilities. So um, I'll go back to my roots and vote for Blackheath as my, my ground. I'll give Beckenham a vote because it's about five minutes that way, which I love, <laughs> rather than an hour and a quarter to Canterbury. You know what yeah, I'm talking about there. To be fair, I mean, we played at another ground in Beckenham in our day because we, we played a couple of John Player League matches at one of the other grounds in Beckenham before the, the new Beckenham ground was there. So, we, you know, how many grounds were there? Well, there must have been, I don't know, getting on for double figures, I would have thought. Yeah, a lot of the bank grounds and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Asif, did you used to enjoy touring around the, the county, going to all these different venues? Yes, I loved it because, uh, the, and the main reason for that is sort of, uh, uh, you know, mixing with the uh, supporters. They used to follow, and uh, for for me, coming from Pakistan, from a background where they didn't have a regular professional cricket, and we didn't have crowds like uh, we started when when I started playing county cricket, I started uh, seeing the uh, the interaction. With the crowd, so I loved I loved playing on all the ground. But favorite ground I would say Canterbury, because that's where I started my county career when I first came, and I still remember it was a cold day. It was raining when I uh, remember uh, getting off at Canterbury Station, taking a train and going to the uh, sorry, taking a taxi going to the ground. And Leslie Ames, he was the secretary, I think, and secretary manager, some 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 yeah something like that. And he came out uh, from his office and he sort of took me around and he showed me and there was this beautiful tree in the sort of corner of the ground, which was within the playing area. So that memory has stuck with me. So I loved Canterbury, playing at uh, Canterbury, but Tunbridge Wells, especially with the you know beautiful settings that it had. But other than that, I just enjoyed playing anywhere. I loved playing everywhere. Oh, yes. The rhododendrons of Tunbridge Wells. Absolutely. Very beautiful. Um, John, what about you? What's your favourite Kent ground? Um, I, I, I think I would endorse what the others have said. I mean, Tunbridge Wells was probably is probably the prettiest. Um, but I sort of grew up at um, the St Lawrence ground because I, I play a lot of cricket for St Lawrence and Highland Court. So I played my club cricket when I was qualifying at, at Canterbury. 
and um, so that was like my that was my home ground, so so to speak, you know. And I had a reasonable, reasonable, reasonable <laughs> amount of um, success at Canterbury, you know. And I, and I loved it there because you know um, it was the biggest ground, you know. You got the biggest crowds in and it was always a pleasure to to play there. I I used to think I knew almost every blade of grass on the on the ground there. So Canterbury was the number one and Tumbridge Wells number two. Well, a couple of weeks ago we had Chris Penn on here when we went back to the to the nineteen nineties to think it's a very revolting story about the outfield at Dartford, but I won't I won't uh, go over that again. Um, <laughs> people used to walk their dogs. Um, time almost for the final question, which is the star question. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for sending your questions over in advance. And whilst we've been Can talking, it, we never have anywhere near enough time to get through it all. Asif, do you, want to, you want to say something, Asif? Yes, yes. Just, just some, one, one thing uh, before you get to the final questions. Charles, I withdraw my comments earlier on. It was in 1973 against Wooster. Ah against Worcester, and I won the man of the match at that time. Well done, Asif. And, yeah, and that was uh, the match I was referring to. It was 73 right. against Worcester, and that was the second final that we were playing at uh, since I joined Kent. Uh, second final that we played at uh, Lord, and we won the match. And, uh, you know, that was more gratifying, uh, receiving the man of the match, because we won the match. Whereas I won the match, Dillard Cup against Lancashire, one of the man of the match, but we didn't win the match. So I wasn't really that uh, happy about it. But winning the second one was really, really, I was very happy because we won. And then when Jono won the man of the match, I was a bit disappointed that, you know, I got so used to winning man of the match. That was my reason for well, but I didn't Yeah, the only thing I can say, Asif, is <laughs> after that Lancashire match, and we were all a bit depressed, can you, can you remember where we ended up after the dinner? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I, I, think, I think he was seen paddling in the, in the fountains in Trafalgar Square. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and I remember picking up the newspapers. The, yeah. the following morning papers had come out and there yeah. were big headlines about Kent losing, but, you know, it was a great match. Everybody was praising about the match. Yeah, yeah. I do remember now. Yes, thanks, John. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd love to say, right, John, so, so the Charles, silence you I kept. Withdraw. The silence you kept earlier, John, when they were debating this, you just sat there and watched it all unfold, knowing that you'd be proven <laughs> right. Yeah. To do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, only because of the poor knowledge of games. I mean, Charles, you know, they're, they're very lucky they can remember it all. Of, you know, memories. I don't, so. John, I don't I remember. I checked. You know, that's why. But uh. <laughs> anyway, well, I must say that I'm I'm hopeless at remembering games as well. Yeah, well, but John, Sheppy, I don't. Um, Sheppy, I don't think you won any man of the match at Lords, so that's why I don't remember. <laughs> 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 I do. I do remember one match, though. I say one match against, we played at, um, against, against was, Essex, against at Essex. Chelmsford. Yes, yes against I, I Chelmsford. I got the man of the match, and you were upset about it, right? No, 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 no. no. The um, reason was you deserved you, it. You got you got fifty. I got a few yeah. wickets, and you when they the were when and they you won were the match. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. You got. But yeah, the but I remember when the match. I remember they said when they were going to present the man of the match. You started pushing me forward. Yes. yes. And then Gordon, I think it was yeah. Gordon Ross. I'm not bitter or anything I, like that. No, I'm sure you're not. Well, I do I'm remember sure it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and, 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 I, and I also remember after receiving the award, I did say that you, you deserved it. It, it. it should have gone to John Shepard. I did say that. <laughs> anyway. Okay, well, I'll, 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 put it, I'll put it in my book. Don't worry. Please do. There's only a couple of minutes left here, so we need to get okay. on to the star question. I would like to say, if you know, if there's anything you want to say, don't yeah. worry about upsetting your fellow teammates' feelings here. <laughs> um, but so we're going to move on to the star question because it's, um, it's nearly Christmas. And the star question was sent in by Jan, uh, who wins a prize courtesy of uh, Shepherd Neem. Uh, this is for all of you. How did it feel to be part of the Kent team during the 70s? that golden era, successful era for Kent. Did you realize at the time what a legacy you were creating? Asif, do you want to start on this one? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, we didn't know that you were, we were starting a legacy. And personally to me, you know, not only just being a part of the team, but eventually also being made captain of the team. 
was amazing, was an awesome feeling. And I think these, uh, the, 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 the three guys on the panel, uh, you know, they really played a huge role in making my captaincy, the first, the, the first uh, year of my captaincy when I was made, a huge success because we won the championship. Uh, I think we were joint champions with Middlesex, if I'm not mistaken. And that yeah. was a huge, huge sort of, for me, uh, not just a blessing and icing. It was, uh, I mean, it was uh, something I can never, never, never forget. And John, when you look back, is it only in retrospect you realise perhaps what a, a golden era it was? Did you feel it at the time? No, I think I, I, I agree with Asif. I, uh, I knew we had a we had a damn good team. You know, I mean, we had a, at one stage I think we had something like nearly nine internationals or something like that, or at least nine of the players or nine or ten of the players had all scored hundreds. So I mean, to come and face us was you know was I think. Quite awesome for some of the some of the opposition, but I don't think that we ever envisaged that we were, you know, having something that special. You know, it was just it, like I said, for John was said earlier, we were like a family, you know, and we everybody, you know, played for each other, and our success was as a result of us playing for each other. Charles must have been great to have been part of that that golden spell. Yeah, I mean, I I came in later than these guys. I, I came in in '74, and when I joined, there were eight current Test players, and within a year or two, there were two more. In that, Bob Woolmer then became a Test player in '75, and Chris Tabaret just after. Um, but yeah, I felt extremely honoured, and I think I had. Some of the happiest times of my life, you know, playing for Kent in those days. Uh, it was it was a wonderful experience. From Jono, for you, lastly, you started late sixties, all the way through to the mid eighties. So that really was, I suppose, the nucleus of your career. Yeah, it was. I mean, um, it it was a magical time to play cricket in Kent uh, because, and, and when you look back, I mean, obviously, it's something you you wouldn't swap for anything. Um, and it wasn't just on the field, as the guys have talked about. The only thing I, I, I think about is the, the second part of the question, the legacy aspect. I don't think we ever thought about that. It was just we, no. wanted, to, we wanted to enjoy no. it. I, I um, agree with that. Yeah. Um, the, the thing is, for the current players, and ever since the, the mid-'80s, it's been held up as a, well, that's the standard. Well, great, you, you want it to be a sort of legacy. You don't want it to be a burden to the current players. Um, yeah. they're, they're, they're great players in their own right um, and one of the things that struck me coming into the 150th anniversary year was 1970 we went, when we won the championship was the centenary year um, and wouldn't it be great whenever we get to play the 150th year uh, that the, the current guys uh, do exactly the same thing. And I do think that there's the sort of atmosphere that we talked about on and off the field the current guys and the people in the office and the management uh, and the members, that atmosphere is there now. So that for me, there's no, absolutely no reason why they can't do it. And uh, from a personal point of view, magical time to play cricket for Kent. And I wish every player could experience that. I noticed you missed off the announcer from that list of people, but I won't, I won't dwell on it too much. Um, now then, thank you very much, gentlemen, because our time is up. But let's, uh, let's hope we're soon creating another one of these. Uh, for, you know, for, for the next decade or so of Kent Creek. I might put that on eBay, actually. You're all featured in it, as I say, very heavily. Thank you for your thoughts and your contributions this evening. John, great to see you. Not so keen on the shirt, but thank you for joining us. <laughs> oh, you can't keep a good man down, that's why. Or a good <laughs> is, team as well. <laughs> this, yeah, right, OK. Uh, Charles, thank you very much for joining us. Hopefully we'll be seeing you sometime soon down at the Spitfire ground. Not too long to go now. Thank you, Steve. Yes, hopefully when, when we get into August. Yeah. Absolutely. First of August. Jono, thank you very much. Would you be popping down to see us August, September yeah. time? Yeah, well, I hope you, you're in your international bubble by then, doing the, the stuff at the higher level, Steve. <laughs> Me, there is no higher level. Can you see that? Oh, there is <laughs> no higher level than that. And Asif <laughs> it's been a treat to have you with us. Asif, thank you very much. And can I just say, out of the panel of four, for this Spitfire session, you, Asif, have been the man of the match. Of that, there is no question. <laughs> oh, God. No, <laughs> well, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's John Shepard. 
no, 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 no. Go and look it up next week. It'll be there in the record books. That's a bit about Man of the Match tonight's Spitfire session. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for all your questions. Uh, thank you for the star question, winning that prize courtesy of Spitfire. And don't forget, Wednesday, that very special session with Alan Knott. Keep your eyes on Kent's social media channels and on the website for more details. And we'll see you soon for another Spitfire Thanks, session. Guys. Thanks, Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers.